we've interviewed someone who's eminent in the field, um, who's made a lot of contributions. Um, and in particular, I chose uh, Sheldon Zedek uh, because he uh, has had a really interesting career. His uh, contributions have spanned so many different areas of research, and not just research, but uh, in terms of different positions. He's uh, been an administrator, a professor, a consultant, um, and really, to me, embodies the scientist practitioner model of PSYOP. Um, he also is a Bowling Green State University graduate, which I was as well, so that didn't hurt either. Um, so um, I've been hearing about Shelley for a long time, and it's really been an honor to get to meet him. Uh, so if you'll all join me in welcoming uh, Sheldon Zedek. So, so Shelley uh, gets the honor also of being the first person I've ever, ever interviewed. So if it's a little awkward, I apologize, uh, especially to Shelley. So um, I think in general, it's just a good idea to just kind of jump right into it. So I've put together some slides that uh, have some fairly interesting moments from Shelley's career. And we're just going to kind of walk him through this and uh, let him tell us uh, what was happening at this time in, in your life. Uh, so Shelley is from Brooklyn, uh, where he specialized in uh, working in shops. Uh, <laughs> go Brooklyn! And so, uh, and uh, uh, dreaming of being a stickball star, um, we actually I found was able to dig and find uh, his uh, high school yearbook photo uh, from an online yearbook. Were you aware that that existed? No. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> So that was a, a happenstance, also his brother's yearbook photo. And this shop here is uh, on Sutter Avenue, which was where he lived at the time. Um, so Shelly, can you tell us a little bit about this time in your life? And in particular, so your parents were shop owners. I'm wondering how that sort of ended up influencing your attraction to industrial psychology. Okay, uh, first, thank you for doing this. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Nathan, I appreciate it. Uh, as it says, uh, I grew up, as Nathan said, I grew up in Brooklyn in a particular section called Brownsville, uh, which uh, was a very interesting section in Brooklyn. Uh, today people are moving into Brooklyn from Manhattan, so a lot of areas in Brooklyn are qu quite well off now, Park Slope, uh, uh, Borough Park, and things like that, but Br Brownsville was not a good area then, and it's not a good area <laughs> these days. But as Nathan mentioned, my mother and father had a mom and pop grocery store, and I worked on it on occasion. Uh, but mainly, uh, grew up in the streets of uh, Brooklyn, playing all sorts of uh, games that we played in Brooklyn. Uh, there was nothing organized like you have today, where you take your kids to a volleyball practice or a soccer practice, baseball. Uh, we created our own games of stickball, uh, punch ball, uh, stoop ball. Ringolivio, and there is a person at Cal who happens to be from Brooklyn, and he wrote a book on the games that the kids played in Brooklyn. But uh, we didn't have uniforms or anything. We made up our own teams, our own rules, our own decisions, and it was an interesting time. Uh, but I also, as I said, I worked with my parents' store on occasion, but I also worked uh, in other stores. Uh, just when I wasn't playing ball, it was had to work to earn some candy money even though my father and mother sold candy, but I still needed some candy money. <laughs> uh, and later on in, in high school, I uh, delivered meat for a butcher, and then I also worked up in the Catskills at what they called bungalow colonies. Many people in the city of New York would go away to the Catskills in the summer where it was cooler. And so I worked in a bungalow colony as a, they called them a soda jerk. I would make uh, things that you probably never heard of, like an egg cream. Uh, or s soda, ice cream sodas and things like that. So I got a lot of experience early on working. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you think that those experiences, do you think that that attracted you to industrial psychology or? Well, it may have attracted me to industrial psychology because uh, I worked for many years in, um, in the Catskills and stores and things like that. And I was always asking sort of questions, you know, why are they doing that? Yeah. So there's a lot of why questions related to work environments. So I think that probably was a catalyst for why I decided eventually to go into IO psychology. And so in your autobiography, and, and it's evident in your yearbook, you talk about this generic term of doctor, which was <laughs> what you wanted to be, right? And yeah. so, um, and, and I've noticed this with industrial psychologists, it seems like a lot of us 
kind of floated and weren't 100 percent sure we wanted what we wanted to do and then we end up just studying what other people do you, do you think that was the case for you or no uh, it was sort of expected that i would be a doctor ah, okay <laughs> okay look at that a real real doctor right the culture <laughs> was that i would be a real doctor yeah and so uh i did start out uh, when i was graduating from high school i then went to brooklyn college which is part of the city university of new york uh, as many other kids from uh, brooklyn went and there i thought i would be a doctor and as you have there uh, um, the Wi-Fi wants to join in here. I started and I took uh, courses like, you know, organic chemistry, anatomy, and biology, and I was doing well in those courses. But also, um, I probably wasn't a very serious student. Uh, <coughs> and um, got involved in a number of social activities, was playing uh, what we call intramural sports, mm -hmm. uh, again, from my stickball days. Uh, and then um, I took a course in uh, physics, and I said, you have it there in <laughs> less than a C, so you can figure out what it was. Uh, it wasn't an F, but uh, <laughs> that ended my views about going to medical school, because uh, grades were really important. I never enjoyed uh, uh, physics, yeah. and it's reflected in there. And um, I found out about that grade when I took a trip to Florida during spring break, and I think that would have been 64. Yeah. And I called home and said, well, what are my grades like? And my father, wasn't very happy because uh, <laughs> the, they went the dream of having a son, my son, the doctor, yeah. <laughs> the real doctor. Yeah. So. And so on this trip to Miami, I found this interesting. You talk about kind of having some revelations, traveling through the South and seeing kind of what things were like at this time. And can, can you speak to that and, do you, do you, and how that might have influenced your later years? Yeah, I think it did have an impact. Uh, Again, keep in mind, when I grew up in Brooklyn, particularly in the section of Brownsville, it was a highly integrated area. There were a lot of uh, Jewish people, Irish people, Catholic people, Italian, Puerto Ricans, uh, African Americans. And I, that was natural, you know, that everybody just got along. We played these games together. We went to each other's apartments. None of us lived in homes. Mm -hmm. It was always an apartment. And so to me, it just seemed natural that People get along with each other. Then I took this trip with a couple of my friends. It was a bus trip from Brooklyn to Miami for uh, the spring break and was really shocked when we stopped in certain places and they said the bathroom for the blacks is over there and the whites would have to go to this particular bathroom but blacks weren't allowed. That was a real eye opener. And then even on some occasions we'd stop in certain places in the south where the blacks went to the back of the bus. Yeah. And you know, I'd read about those things, and keep in mind, this was like 1964, just as the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So there were lots of demonstrations that I was familiar with. And again, I grew up in a very integrated neighborhood uh, where there were no differences as a function of race. So we all treated each other uh, fairly. My, a lot of the shops, uh, shoppers in my father's store mm -hmm. were, um, Minor minorities weren't Caucasians, they were Puerto Ricans and African Americans, and my father always treated them fairly. In fact, it, those were the days before you had uh, iPads or anything like that, and um, he would always, they'd come in, buy groceries, and he would write down on a piece of paper that they spent $8.50, and when they would get paid, at the end of the month, they'd come pay him. So yeah. we just treated people differently than I saw it in Miami. So I, I think it did have an impact subsequently, uh, conscious or unconscious. Yeah. I don't know. So the next day, so you graduate Brooklyn College, um, and you end up, so you end up deciding to go into industrial psychology, and how did you get guided to that in the first place, okay. industrial psychology? At uh, Brooklyn College, we did not have a course in industrial psychology. So I took experimental psychology, that's what we call it then, I think they call it cognitive psychology now. I took uh, some biological, we called it physiological psychology, some social psychology, personality. I took history, which I enjoyed. But the course I enjoyed most was uh, data analysis. So as I'm starting to think about uh, graduating in 1965 from uh, Brooklyn College, uh, well, what am I gonna do? Um, no longer going to medical school. Um, so I thought, well, there was, at that time there were two options. Uh, one is to go to graduate school, well, the second option was to go to Vietnam. And I thought I'd rather go to graduate school <laughs> than to Vietnam. I thought that was a good decision myself. Uh, 
that some of you well, may be contemporaries, Ed, that, that in those days uh, we had draft cards and we were eligible to be called. You had a deferment if you were in a college, so you weren't called. But as soon as you graduated from college, you're most likely going to be drafted, and in those days uh, you were going to Vietnam. And I thought, well, it would be better to go to graduate school. And so not knowing anything about IO psychology, I went to the library because I was always working. Uh, I actually worked up in the Catskill Antlers at a famous hotel, the Concord Hotel. I don't know if you're from New York, you might have, might have heard of it. I worked there over some breaks. Uh, I wasn't interested in clinical psychology, but again, I was interested in why people did things at work. So I found there's a course, there's a program, IO psychology. So I said, well, why don't I apply to a graduate school in IO psychology? Now, never having been west of uh, Queens, uh, <laughs> I applied to several schools in Ohio, uh, Bowling Green, I think I applied to Ohio State and Case Western Reserve, and I got into Bowling Green, yeah. and there was someone at Bowling Green already who had been to Brooklyn College, so Bowling Green seemed like a good place to go <laughs> to, but, and I knew only a little bit about uh, Bob Guyon, whose picture is right over here. Yeah. Yeah. And so you tell a funny story uh, in, uh, about, uh, in there about someone saying hello to you, do you remember this? Oh, <laughs> Our yeah, nice day. Yeah, thank you for yeah. reminding me. Yeah, again, coming from New York, uh, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, and you know what a New Yorker is like. Uh, at least you have your stereotype. And I remember Bowling Green had a population of about 14,000. Uh, and then when the students were there, the population doubled at the time. It was around 28,000 then. It's, it's the, the same now. Same, uh, yeah. <laughs> same numbers. And Bowling Green was really small. It had one movie theater, no mall. Um, Best restaurant was a bar, Kaufman's, if you remember. Uh, Holiday Inn was the other place to eat, I think. It was a Dairy Queen. So it really wasn't much. And so I remember one day, uh, early in my time at Bowling Green, I was crossing the street, and someone said hello to me. And that was a shock that somebody would say hello to a stranger. So I checked my wallet, and I looked at them. <laughs> 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 you just didn't say that in New York to people who you didn't know. So it was a... Uh, an experience, again, totally different atmosphere and culture yeah. than I was accustomed to having grown up in the uh, streets of New York. Yeah. And so we w one of the pictures here is you with Pat Smith, who was your advisor, uh, who I told you I was lucky enough to see give a talk at Bowling Green uh, yeah. before she passed away. Um, can you tell, speak a little bit about her, what she was like yeah. as an advisor? Okay. And yeah. Let me just give a little bit of background. When I went <coughs> to Bowling Green, uh, Bob Guyon had just returned from a year at uh, Berkeley, which becomes important later on. Yeah. Uh, and he was the only I.O. psychologist at the time, and I went in on the master's program because I wasn't even thinking of a doctor because they didn't have a doctorate program then. While I was there, they started working on being able to offer the doctorate, and they started to recruit uh, Pat Smith, Patricia Kane Smith, who was very famous for the job descriptive inventory, the satisfaction inventory, and also behavioral expectation scales, um, one, which I started doing research on subsequently. So, um, after my first year there, then Pat came with her husband, Oli Smith, who was sort of a IO psychologist too, uh, and they also recruited uh, Joe Cranny. Yeah. So then they had Guy and Cranny and Pat Smith, and uh, I decided to work with Pat Smith, because uh, she seemed broad, broad, even though I was really interested in testing and selection, because it was data analysis that in fact drove me probably into IO psychology, because that's what I like, statistics. And like so, but I started working with Pat, and she was just fantastic uh, as a mentor. Uh, always accessible. We'd go to her house uh, quite frequently. She'd have us over there morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, we'd have a social gathering at uh, Pat's house with, o with her husband Oli. But she was always available to answer questions and to encourage you to do what you wanted and what you thought was right or interesting, not necessarily what was expected of you. So uh, my first publication was with Pat in the Journal of Applied. And um, to be quite frank, and Pat was, uh, wasn't surprised, but we sent in the, uh, this will never happen today, we sent in the article to Journal of Applied, and Ken Clark was the editor of Journal of Applied at the time, and we got it back with acceptance without any revision. Said, Boy, this is easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was the editor of APA with a 90% rejection rate. <laughs> so, but it was Pat. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, but she was really good uh, in terms of mentoring me and uh, giving me the freedom to do what I wanted to study. 
Um, my dissertation was on a prediction model, uh, a multivariate prediction model of the testing, which is what I sort of developed my career around. Uh, but she was my dissertation advisor, and Guyan sort of would read it, because Guyan had become, as I was uh, going through my career at uh, Bowling Green, Guyan became the chair of the department, and he had less and less time to work with students. And besides, uh, some of you may know this, uh, Frank Landy is a Bowling Green graduate, and Frank was there one year before me, uh, and so I was a year behind Frank, but Frank became Bob Guyan's student, and I was Pat Smith's student. So there was somewhat of a little rivalry between Landy and myself, even though we became very good friends and done, did a number of things afterwards. So, um, but Bob was also very good to me in terms of helping me with my dissertation research and kinds of things. He, uh, one of the things about Bob Guyan, which probably would not, if you knew Bob Guyan, you would wonder about what I'm gonna say. If any of us mentioned we thought we'd go into consulting, you would never say that in front of Bob Guyan. <laughs> You had to be an academic. Uh, but then towards the end, he got himself a consulting, two consulting <laughs> projects, one of which uh, I worked on writing exams for real estate licensure, something like that, because yeah, he had the contract. But the more important project that he got was, uh, if you're familiar with the position analysis questionnaire, the PAQ that um, McCormick developed and that generates subsequently, well, a uh, guy got a consulting project in Armco Steel, somewhere in the south of uh, Ohio. And he took all of the graduate students, and we thought this was great, because we went on a consulting trip, and they gave us uh, boots with the steel plates, and we wore ha hard hats, et cetera, because we were gonna go around a uh, factory, and we were to do a job analysis of what they did using the PAQ, the original Position Analysis Questionnaire. Now, I think it's changed today, but in those days, it was quite the, uh, a device in terms of the vocabulary. So I'd be sitting there with uh, some gentleman and was male, basically males, no females, you know, by a furnace, a guy feeding uh, steel rods in there, et cetera. So what do you think the deductive reasoning is in your job? <laughs> and they would look at me, because well, that's what it said here. So uh, what about information processing? So it was an experience trying to explain what the PAQ meant to people who you know, but it was a really learning experience, and I carried some of that forward when I've done my own job analyses. But uh, so Bob was uh, my very influential in uh, my career at Bowling Green. But Pat was I uh, owe a lot to Pat, and both of them, to be quite frank, did not like the way I wrote. So they would always mock up my papers uh, with red markings. But the, they were, I greatly respected them, and I'm glad I studied with both of them. So, so can you settle it once and for all, who was the first PhD, Frank yeah, Green? There's a debate. Cause, oh, then well, after my first year, they got the approval to have a doctoral program. So um, I applied to the doctoral program. It was another, I figured, oh, gee, another three years, four years of avoiding Vietnam. We were still in Vietnam. Um, and I got in, and Frank also got in. Uh, again, Frank was Bob's student, and I'm Pat's student. And then uh, they had never had produced a PhD. So there's a debate as to whether uh, I'm the first PhD, or Frank is the per first PhD, and Frank, had a, if he was here now, would tell you he was. The <laughs> truth is, <laughs> since Frank's not here to defend himself, uh, is I was the first PhD. <laughs> because I, and Frank will have admitted this, I took my examination first. I had to defend my examination first, and Frank went after me to defend his graduation. But at graduation, when they gave out the degree, they went in alphabetical order. So where does Z oh. fall? <laughs> so Landy went before me, and then I uh, followed him. So he claims he's the first PhD. He's the first one to be awarded the degree. I was the first one to pass the exam. <laughs> and speaking of the exam, uh, this is also a funny, I think a funny story. And those, again, it's a new program, so to give students experience, uh, students were allowed to attend the oral examination. And so you're sitting there, and uh, Bob Guyon, Pat Smith, uh, Mike Doherty, Joe Cranny, these are all, and then I had someone from outside the program. I'm worried, what questions are they gonna ask me, et cetera, and it looks like it's almost about 10. Then a hand pops up. Frank has a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, it was 
a, fortunately, it was an easy question. But I'm saying, well, what the hell are you doing, Frank? <laughs> I'll get even with you. <laughs> but Frank so, asked the question in my oral defense. So. But we became very good friends and very close and did things together. So it was a good experience at uh, Bowling Green. Um, again, it was a small town with the one movie theater, so there was nothing to do but study. So I got out in four years. Today, people get out in six, seven years. It took me four years to get out because I would just sit in the library, do what I had to do, um, and to earn money. I also did worked with uh, an experimental psychologist. I ran rats, counted rat vocalizations to shock. That was a popular thing to do in those days. So I earned money. Yeah. Well, you would be surprised at how little has changed. Right. Like in the 40s <laughs> no, when surprised. I was there, yeah. <laughs> well, one yeah, one well, movie, th actually yeah. zero movie theaters, right. if I recall. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and so Bob Guyon helps you get your first job at UC Berkeley. Okay. That's another funny yeah. story, Landy Zedek story. Um, <coughs> it's our last year, it's 1968, 69. Both Frank and I were working on dissertations, and we went on the job market. And so, again, Frank was a Bob student, and Bob gets a call from somebody at Penn State, uh, Don Trumbo, that they have an opening. So Bob sent Frank out for the interview, and lo and behold, Frank got a job. So great for Frank, so, but I still didn't have a job. In fact, I interviewed at one industry place, because I thought maybe I'd go into industry, and then I asked this a dumb question at the time. I said, what time do you come to work here? And they said, 8 o'clock, because that's when the clients expect you to be here. So I said, well, that job is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then what happened is, remember, Guyon had been a visitor at Berkeley in 63, 64, or something like that. So they de decided at Berkeley, which at the time had Ed Gazelli, uh, Milt Blood, and Bill Graham on the faculty there, to invite Bob out for another year sabbatical in 69, 70. But Bob had just, as I said, become chair of the department, and he couldn't go. So he said to Gazelli, Graham and Blood, would you like a new PhD? And it wasn't Frank, because Frank already committed to Penn State. So he said, we have Zedek coming out. So would you like Zedek? So they said, yeah, we'll take him. <laughs> and then they asked me, would you like to come out? Well, my wife and I, Marty, had never been west of Chicago at that time, so let's go to California for one year. So we went to California, to Berkeley for one year. I went in part because of Ed Gazelli, who some people say is like the father of industrial organizational psychology. He has written books on measurement uh, and leadership and other kinds of things. And uh, he was a terrific person, also a terrific mentor. But I went there to study with, to be part or work with Ed, uh, who was, again, a wonderful gentleman. And so I went out to Berkeley in 69. And being new to California, my wife, Marty, was sitting in the front row, and I toured quite a bit of California. And then it was came about, uh, I think, November, when, uh, if you ha ever heard the name of Richard Crutchfield, Dick Crutchfield from Crutch and Crutchfield, the social psychology book, the old time this matter, uh, Crutchfield was in the department, and he came to me one day. And keep in mind how this was done then, old boys network. Today, you can never get by with this in terms of the legal aspects. Uh, Crutchfield came to me and said, would you like a tenure track position here? So we thought about it for like a day. <laughs> and we said, sure. And that's how, going from a one year visiting appointment, I retired after 43 years on the faculty at Berkeley. But there was no competition, no one else was invited out. I didn't give a job talk. Uh, it was just, you know, hey, would you like a job? <laughs> <Tenure track? laughs> well, this is easy. <laughs> so, um, I studied there, but the bad news was, um, in those days, uh, industrial organizational psychology was not considered basic science. And the psychology department at Berkeley is highly, was highly, and is today, you have to do basic science. So they had retired about two, three years after I got there, and Blood and Graham left about 73, 74. And so, we had to decide what we were going to do. Uh, and this is where I think work life and quality of life came into our decision making. Um, I started looking at jobs elsewhere, and I had a good offer from an East Coast school um, with, uh, at one point, with tenure. But uh, we decided we'd rather raise our children in California than in New York. Um, and so we decided to see what happens if I can get tenure at uh, Berkeley and go through the process there. 
and recognizing also that I would, they would never replace blood and Graham nor Gazelli, that I would be the only one. So my strategy was, well, I'd go to meetings like SIA and establish relationships with colleagues, yeah. and that would be my strategy. And it worked out, yeah. I think, successfully. But the, when I retired in 40, in, in, uh, after 40 plus years in 2010, I wasn't replaced, so there is no I.O. psychology in the psychology department at uh, Berkeley anymore. Now it's mainly every, all psych departments seem to be neuroscience. Yeah. Uh, neuroscience clinical, neuroscience social, neuroscience this, that, and the other thing. So that was unfortunate, but the, throughout the many years that I was there, I was still able to accept students. They, I was, became part of the social psychology group, which was also having problems at Berkeley at the time. So Christina Maslach and I at one point were the social IO group, and then we hired some more people in social psychology. But I was able to produce very good students, some of whom are sitting here, Rick Jacobs, Yochi Kong Karash, and Chris, Chris Banks is sitting in the back, was my undergraduate. So we got very good students at Berkeley, and um, it, it worked out very well. Yeah. Did you, did you meet with many difficulties, uh, uh, much like, did any other faculty resist the idea of you continuing to try to get tenure without kind of a home No, program? in fact, okay. they said if you want to be part of the social group, that's fine. And I had very good relationships, personal relationships with the faculty in cognitive biological for like 17 to 18 years. I was part of the poker group. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Played poker once a month, <laughs> uh, and we got along very well, and they said, and they had a vote on my tenure. Yeah. And uh, I had to get letters, as you do, from outside people. And, but they voted it, and I got tenure. And s to show, I think, that the, I was re appreciated and respected, I eventually became the chair of the department. <laughs> uh, but I couldn't hire an industrial psychologist. <laughs> it wasn't part of the deal. Yeah. Uh, and then even in administration, I wound up being, at one point, the vice provost for the campus. So my career at Berkeley, there was no negative impact of the fact that I, I was an I.O. psychologist. I was yeah. not treated uh, unfairly by anybody. That's great. And so, so in po post tenure, um, you start to travel. You go to Israel. You start uh, doing research and performance appraisal, um, and and really uh, kind of making your name there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? I know one of my graduate students was interested in how you felt like the international travel that you did to Israel and in other places. Um, affected your research and how it, you know, how that influenced you. Okay, good. Yeah, so I got tenure in 1976, the beginning of uh, July 176, I think was the date that my tenure took place. So I also went on a sabbatical. Uh, and my th approach to sabbaticals, I mean, I was chair and also as colleagues, if you're gonna go on a sabbatical, go away from your home university. Because I used to say when I was chair, if you're gonna stay here and I see you in the hall, I may ask you to do something, and that's <laughs> not the purpose of a sabbatical, it's to go away and study elsewhere. So in my 40 plus years, I think we took uh, five, six sabbaticals, and all but one were overseas. So I wound up teaching and traveling in Israel, Sweden, Australia, Amsterdam, Hong Kong, Beijing, and other places, always going away. There's one year I spent in the uh, States on a sabbatical, maybe talk about that, is oh, yeah. at AT&T. Yeah. I spent the year, this is before AT&T divested and became all these different companies, but I learned a lot about assessment centers. But um, I went to Israel, we did research there, I worked with the Israeli military on policy capturing of how to explain people's interview processes. We got a publication out of that with an Israeli colleague. Uh, I went to Sweden because I was interested in work-life things, and Sweden was supposedly good for work-life uh, issues. And so in a lot of these places, I would collaborate or make contact with colleagues there in terms of doing some research or studying or learning from them. So our travel um, got us out of the country. It also gave us an opportunity for our children to be exposed to different cultures. They, in every situation overseas, uh, Marty, you cannot get this correct, they went to the local school as opposed to an English uh, diplomat school. So in Israel, they went to the local schools, to the kindergarten, the nurseries, and in Sweden, my daughter went to the school around the corner. In the corner. So it was also good for our children in terms of learning about the different cultures. And I think that's really critical 
uh, to expose your family and children to other cultures besides where you live. So that was very good. Uh, performance appraisal work is what I start on. It was a continuation of what Pat Smith had taught me about behavioral expectation scales. And we were studying kinds of things with Rick Jacobs and Dietz Capri and others uh, in terms of uh, how people make decisions uh, from a behavioral perspective, looking at behaviors as opposed to traits for evaluating uh, people. So started uh, there. Uh, and so that's um, my travel, my performance appraisal work. Uh, you also have overcoming a personal hardship. Uh, you got that up there. Um, we had had two children then in 1975. Before we went on sabbatical, we had a third child. Uh, and shortly after she was born, maybe six months, eight months, we recognized that there was an issue. And it turned out that she was born with a undeveloped uh, brain. And so, we did everything we could in the States. Uh, I remember being in Florida and the University of California in San Francisco to try and do some things. But we took a, with us to Israel and had Israeli hospitals and doctors look at it. And the prognosis was that um, he was not gonna have any life uh, in terms of the undeveloped brain. So we had to deal with that uh, in Israel and coming back. Uh, but it also, gives you some insight as to what your career is all about. And it, I think it did change me to some respect. Um, I may have thrown myself more into my work at the time to avoid the problems, even though I think I did devote time to, to trying to figure out what happened. She eventually passed away at the age of like two and a half, three, three. Um, but uh, it was always hardship, but I had the support of colleagues at Berkeley uh, and friends and relatives. Uh, but something that uh, caused me to think more about work life, which I subsequently started to do some research on. And so do you think, and you know, and I, first of all, I want to commend Shelley for talking about this. And it was something I, I wanted to talk about a little bit because I think at some point all of us will experience some type of, uh, uh, you know, personal tragedy. Um, and this is at a very busy time in your life. It, it, and I know that we kind of talked about this and you said, well, I'm not sure if I have great advice, but is there anything that you can think of that really helped to get you through that kind of time or? Well, I think uh, support from family and friends um, helps quite a bit. Uh, but then was my, I think uh, I'm a workaholic to begin with. Uh, I think that's from growing up again in my parents' store and working as a child. I've always been working. So I threw myself more into work. I'd work uh, on weekends, Saturdays, but Sundays I'd go to all of the games and activities of um, I had two other children, two older children at the time. Um, so I think it's, um, you have to find something to involve yourself in to sort of take your mind off the, the problem you're having. I have no better advice than yeah. that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking about that. So. Um, so not long after this, you go to AT&T, and we have here Mary Jennifer, who you've um, sort of told me you had a very good relationship with and was really instrumental with you. The thing about Mary Jennifer, who probably a lot of you know or know of, is that, and this really relates also to Bob Guyon, when I got my degree and I went out to Berkeley, in the early 70s, Bob Guyon was the... Uh, the president of at that time it was division 14 that's before we were SIA and so guy and again would call and say Shelley would you like to be on a committee for division 14 uh, sure uh, I my problem my wife says if I come home and say it's interesting she knows it's a problem but I'm gonna say yes to something <laughs> so I thought it would be interesting to be on a committee um, and so he says we'll put you on the education and training committee and the chair of that is a person named Mary Tenniper Sounds good to me. So I did, it, so I met Mary, and this was in the early 70s. And Mary was also a fantastic mentor, uh, right as can be in terms of validation, methodology, data analysis, et cetera. So she taught me quite a bit. And then when I came time for sabbatical in 82, 83, uh, I was interested in assessment. So again, this is before they broke AT&T up, and AT&T was one company for the whole country. And they had the largest uh, 
group of psych IO psychologists or psychologists in general, there must have been 25 to 30 psychologists working in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And so I decided to go there uh, for a sabbatical. I was invited by, not so much by Mary, because she worked in one unit in selection, but I wanted to learn about assessment centers. So I went to the unit with uh, Dick Campbell, and in the previous uh, slide, if you can back up a little bit, yeah, see those two guys? Well, there's Ken Wesley in the middle, and Joel Moses is to, as you're looking at towards your left, Joel Moses was there, uh, Dick Riley, uh, Doug Bray, uh, Don Campbell, all famous people in assessment centers, people who developed the whole literature on assessment centers, and I wanted to learn about assessment centers. So I went there for the year, and I learned an awful lot about assessment centers, but also worked with Mary. Because uh, Mary is also the first one who got me into consulting. In the mid-70s, she said to me, she called, I was working on the Education and Training Committee, and I'm sort of a, she thinks I'm Bob Guyon's student, and which is okay with me, uh, and it was okay with Bob, um, <laughs> that she said, would you like to do a consulting project? Sure, it sounds interesting. <laughs> so the consulting project was I knew nothing about physical ability, is in those days they had people climbing poles, um, going, uh, lifting up what we called manholes, and going in underground the streets doing things, installers repair people, and we wanted to they wanted to develop a physical ability test. Well, I didn't know much about physical ability, yeah. uh, but I was learning how to do validation, and that's what Mary was responsible. So Mary guided me through this process of validation of a physical ability test, which was subsequently published. Um, but as a result of her, I'd also travel around the country because we did this in multiple sites. And I learned how to work in groups by sitting in with Mary as we were talking to pole climbers, repair people, and the like. And one of the things I learned from Mary, which I always did in job analysis, and I think I passed on to students, if you're gonna do a job analysis to develop a selection test, you ought to try the job so you could talk to the person doing it. Just don't read about it and own it or whatever, but actually do the job. And so um, Mary got me and started that, and then Mary throughout the years would provide other consulting opportunities for me. Yeah, and so throughout your career, you've done a lot of consulting, and another good guy kind of fielded some questions from my graduate students that they might have for you, and one was, and so throughout your career, one of the things I said before you came in is I really think you embody the scientist practitioner model, how do you feel that, you know, really starting to get into consulting, and I kept to think at this point is kind of when you really start doing more of that. How do you think that influenced your academic work and vice versa? Well, I think for just about every single consulting project that I took, it was sort of an understanding that there would be a research aspect to it. And so a number of my publications were based on consulting projects. Uh, but there was some research component. So I was able to combine a research question with trying to address the organization's problem. And so that's sort of the scientist practitioner model. And again, uh, I think I have, you know, my record, maybe one publication or two that's based on the laboratory study. Everything else based on the research that I did uh, in organizations. And uh, I usually have the permission of the organization that can I, you know, deal with your problem, yeah. Uh, yeah, but also would I be able to publish anything if I found something interesting mm -hmm. yeah. and useful? That's great. So. Okay, so at this point you sort of start to switch your emphasis, as we mentioned before, to some, some work family, work life balance uh, kind of thing. I, I don't even know if the, the phrase had been coined at this time, as you said, and, and you were really kind of ahead of your time in this area in a way. Uh, I don't think this was. Yeah. Okay. It came time for me to uh, give my presidential address. Now, when you get elected as president, in fact, I saw Fred Oswald this morning. He said, have you written your presidential address next year that he'll give in Chicago? Yeah. You start thinking, what are you going to say? And so I looked around at the, what other presidents had said, and the presidential address that had the most impact on me was one by Lyman Porter. Most presidents at the time spoke about their research. Lyman well, Porter spoke about an issue that he thought was important, politics and psychology, which IO psychologists hadn't studied. So given my beginning interest in work and life issues, 
He says, I know psychologists don't study work life. So I did a video review of literature, and there was really nothing by Ohio psychologists. There were clinical psychologists, community psychologists, educational psychologists, etc. So I said, well, it would be interesting to talk at the, when I have to give my presidential address about work life. So I did that, and then they subsequently asked me to edit the volume. And I think the volume came out in 92. It, uh, 91. 91, 92, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so in 86, I think I gave my presidential address. Okay. So nothing happened, but now we have a handbook of work and life that Tammy Allen has uh, written. So now it is a popular topic. So uh, I may have been ahead of my time in yeah. that one, but uh, I thought it was an issue being personal, and I thought work influences what happens in the family, and what happens in the family influences yeah. at work. Yeah. And now I think it's particularly important also with dual careers. When, when I was doing some of this research, basically the male was the breadwinner and the females were not as active in the workforce as they are today. And so uh, so then you become SIOP president. Uh, this is you at, a, I think, some kind of function with past SIOP presidents. I've got you circled out there. Um, so you <coughs> have talked about how, you know, when you became SIOP president, it was this kind of odd time in SIOP's history where we're trying to figure out what is the relationship between APA and Division 14? And so can you tell us about kind of some of the issues you ran into there? Okay. So I, I was president in 86, uh, but I'd been on an executive committee probably from, from 76 till then, uh, chairing different committees, uh, workshop committee, education and training, different ones. So I was part of the group along with, I think, Milt Hockel, Ben Schneider, Irv Goldstein, uh, Mary Pennefer uh, and others in figuring out what we should do with Division 14 because we were feeling alienated from American Psychological Association in terms that they were more clinically oriented and were not interested in IO psychology. So we had numerous discussions as to what we should do and in the early 80s, and I give Milt Hockel a lot of credit for this and Ben Schneider, Jack Bartlett or Goldstein, uh, deciding we should become an incorporated society, be an independent group. And that's when we became SIOP. So I was involved in that. I was involved in planning the first SIOP Congress or convention in Chicago in 1985 or something like that. I don't remember exactly, 85, 84, when we have 4,600 attending this one. I think we may have had 600 attending the first one in Chicago, some really low number. Uh, we started the SIOP series during that period for research and then subsequently for practice. And we would have sessions and meetings with APA. Uh, are you going to pay attention to us or are we going to just withdraw because we could withdraw and maintain ourselves <coughs> as the Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology because we were in incorporated as a society. So there were a lot of issues about in those days about what should we be. Uh, but planning the first... Uh, Convention was interesting. I was on the planning committee, so uh, this will really be of interest to you. We had no exhibitors. We didn't want exhibitors. This is going to be a science con convention, and it could be at a single hotel, and typically we would say in, in a city that didn't have distractions. <laughs> so we'd all sit around, and it had to have a, an area in the hotel where everybody could sit and talk to each other. So big spaces where you got sofas and chairs and talk to each other. And we didn't have, what do we have, 900 sessions here? Uh, know, something like sure, that. Yeah. Uh, so it was really small, but the idea was we would talk to each other and communicate with each other and meet and socialize with each other. It's changed, obviously, yeah. drastically. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> that's great. So in, a, in the, well, I think we're going to kind of skip ahead a little here. And this is a, a part of your life that I'm really interested in is some of this later work you've been doing uh, with with uh, uh, law school admissions testing, uh, trying to minimize bias. You've won awards for this, uh, the Smashing Bias Award, and um, this really has made an impact. Uh, there are New York Times articles about your work in this. Uh, um, so can you just tell us a little bit about some of this stuff? Yeah, but if I may, if you could just Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Now, we, this yeah, is a yeah, critical yeah. part. Okay, yeah, yeah. In the late 1980s, I got involved in working in the city of San Francisco to develop as part of a consent decree an examination for firefighters. And as part of a consent decree, each of the sides has a representative. So to, as you're looking at it to your right is Jim Oots. He represented the 
minority group. In the middle is Eric Goldstein, who represented the Department of Justice, and Wayne Cassio came on as just, the, he was just an expert. I represented the city of San Francisco. It, the notion of a consent decree, two things, it's the best thing you can do, because we're not at odds with each other. Our goal was, what can we develop that works for everybody? And in 1988, we actually developed a test that had no adverse impact against minorities, and it was very successful, and we published things on the sliding ban, et cetera. But the other thing, it goes back to my statement before, that uh, being alone at Berkeley, I'd have to form relationships with people elsewhere. And both those three guys became my best friends. I've gone to their children's weddings. They've come to my children's weddings. Unfortunately for Jim and Irv, who passed away in the last couple of years, um, they became best friends. And so not only was it career fulfilling, yeah. but from on a personal level, it was really rewarding to work with uh, those three. And I st Wayne and I did a three-hour seminar this morning, so we're still working together. So well, that, well, one question I did want to ask you about that is, it really seems like friendship has played a huge role in your research career, and in particular the 80s and on. Um, you know, how important do you think that that is in terms of collaboration and, and things like that? Well, it's critical. I mean, uh, I like to work with people, and I like to work with people I like. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it works. And one of the nice things at Berkeley at the beginning of the early 70s is I was able to bring out visitors because I was the only one. Oh, yeah. So. Wayne was a visitor, uh, Rich Arvey was a visitor, uh, Ken Wexley was a visitor, yeah, yeah. and they became friends over the years. And so uh, friendships are important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. Makes life easy, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. So now this one. Well. Yeah, and so, so the, we talked about the law school uh, admissions tests, uh, or the, the tests that you've developed to help to reduce adverse impact. Okay, I'll skip the JAP. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's just too much, guys. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the law school project is something that I'm still working on today as we speak. It's almost 20 years. We started in 1998 when the state of California passed what they call Proposition 209, which says thou shall not use race or gender in any decision that relates to a state institution for employment or admission. So at the time for the law school at Berkeley, they did have a special program to admit uh, particularly African-Americans because the LSAT results in adverse impact. The LSAT is the law school admission test, which results in adverse impact uh, particularly against African-Americans. And so, uh, and this shows you what friendship does and how it works, is uh, the law school said this is a problem because when they couldn't use the special program and they had to admit students based on the LSAT, I believe there was one African American who got admitted in a class of a couple hundred. It may have been more, but I, we always talk about one, and he was in admission the prior year, but didn't come, so they admitted him this coming year. Uh, but wow. they had a problem, so I had a friend in the law school who was on a committee to figure out what to do. So one day he comes to me and says, Shelley, you work on selection issues, can you come talk to our committee? So I went and told the committee what I do in industry, in the physical ability testing, in San Francisco firefighting, how we've developed, I consider innovative techniques to have a more diverse workforce. So the next thing they said, well, why don't you and one of our colleagues, the woman there, Marge Schultz, who's in the law school, apply for a grant to study the problem. So I said, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> this is 1998. <laughs> and so we applied to the Law School Admission Council for a grant to study what could be an alternative or substitute for the law school admissions test? And so this is 1998, and we spent uh, about 10 years studying lawyers uh, in terms of what it takes to be an effective lawyer. And we probably the only ones in the, I'd say the country, maybe the world, who actually have performance data on attorneys. Uh, we evaluated approximately 1,100 attorneys on a subset of 26 performance dimensions. In our job analysis, uh, working with attorneys, we identified there are 26 factors that can be used to define effectiveness of an attorney. All 26 don't apply to a single attorney. It depends if you're criminal, civil, whatever, but the subset does. And so we evaluated 1,100 attorneys, uh, and we also gave them various tests that we had developed, a situational judgment test, a uh, bio data test, a, an emotion recognition test, uh, the Hogan personality test, the Hogan D 
derailment tests. We gave all sorts of tests to uh, 1,100 attorneys. They were all alumni, all practicing attorneys. They were alumni, friendships count, and Marge was the teacher of the year several times in law school. So she'd write the email, I'm working on a project, would you help us out? And we got 1,100 attorneys who responded to our tests and got evaluations. And I'll mention one fact is we asked each attorney after they took our test battery to give us two supervisors and two peers and do a self-evaluation. So we would want five evaluations on you, the respondent, the test taker. So with 1,100 test takers, you'd get 5,500, you could get 5,500 evaluations, right? What blew me away, the best part of this whole data is we got over 4,000 evaluations, which is, the response rate is unbelievable. And they were not necessarily Berkeley Law School alumni. So anyway, we did that research and we came out with terrific results. It made the New York Times. A lot of people are interested, but nothing is happening with it. Yeah. Uh, because uh, that'd be a whole session by itself. It's all yeah. politics. <laughs> One of the, your ranking in the US News and World Report is a function of the average LSAT score of your incoming class. So why change something that could affect your ranking which will really annoy your donors? Yeah. So that's my hypothesis. Okay. So, so, we'll so, and th so you retire in 2010. Right. Now in your autobiography in 1991, you end it by saying something to the effect of like, you know, and I hope things slow down a little bit. Obviously between 1991 and 2010, that was not the case. Uh, do you think, it, have you slowed down? Or now? are you still, yeah, yeah, or. <laughs> no. I yeah. didn't slow down until 2010. My last four and a half years, uh, four years at, at Berkeley, I was the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Faculty Welfare. But again, it, I think in my administrative roles, I also tried to in, uh, implement things that I'd learned as an IO psychologist. Uh, and I was interested in work family. So part of the programs that I developed as Vice Provost, which was responsible for faculty retention, recruitment, and merits for the whole campus, 1,500 faculty, were work-life programs. Yeah. Uh, I implemented a child care, pro uh, some, I worked on child care, emergency backup, partner policy, things that would make it easier for the faculty to be successful. So I, in, in those years when I had to do the bureaucratic administrative stuff, I also used things that I'd learned as an IO psychologist to try and implement. So in 2010, uh, it was after 41 years, I decided to retire. And have I slowed down? No, I'm a workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that. And, yeah. and so I keep on taking on different kinds of things. But we do still continue to try and travel yeah. and spend time with our grandchildren, some of whom yeah, I was going to ask you here. So we have a picture of, of uh, the family here at, at his retirement. Could you uh, just kind of tell us who everybody is here? Uh, I have to stand up. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So this is my oldest daughter, Cindy. These are her boys wearing cow shirts, sweaters, with my <laughs> wife knitted. Uh, her husband. That's me. I haven't changed. Uh, this is my oldest granddaughter. This is Marty, my wife. This is my son and his middle daughter, they subsequently have another daughter, this is his wife, and we have a third child after, uh, one number of years after him, Tracy. So this is the family, we've got one more addition, one more uh, grandchild. That's so great. So, um, so I guess what we're gonna go ahead and um, start to maybe take some questions. Um, I know that we've kind of run just a little bit over, but I'm, I'm hoping you don't mind that much. Uh, so does anybody have any questions for Shelley? Yes, sir. <laughs> so that's a good question. So the question was, how did you meet Marty? We met as undergraduates. She lived in a different part, in a better part of Brooklyn than I lived in. <laughs> and we met when uh, you were a sophomore, I think. We first met. We were friends for a number of years. Uh, when I was a senior and she was a junior, we started to date more seriously. And then uh, I went away to Bowling Green for in August of 65, and she was beginning her senior year, senior year uh, then, and then during that year, wasn't much to do in Bowling Green. <laughs> 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 so, in any event, uh, we got engaged that year, and we got married one year afterwards, and um, Marty came out to Bowling Green. 
which is how you know she really loved you. <laughs> Still a pretty good test. She didn't know what was like. Still an... <laughs> okay, so anybody else? Yes. So, so the question was, uh, what advice would you give to a first-year graduate student? Um, get involved in research as soon as you can. Uh, but also, and this is uh, my gripe against graduate education today in general, is look at literature that's more than five years old. <laughs> uh, I find a lot of literature that's being, what, what people are studying today uh, is the same thing we've been studying 10, 15, 20 years ago. The other thing that over my years of travel to different places, I collected what's considered classics in, um, IO psychology. Frank Landy too, so we competed there too. Right. Mm -hmm. We'd go to bookstores that, as we were traveling and, oh, here's a book by um, Munsterberg. Well, Frank saw it first, so he got it, etc. But uh, we competed there too. Um, and if you look at the table of contents for these books that were written in the early 1900s, the table of contents for IO psychology is no different than, <laughs> than it is in the most recent textbook on IO psychology. His problems are the same. We might be explaining a little bit more variance than we explained 50 years ago, and we're doing it with more elegant statistical strategies, but we are not doing a very good job of uh, explaining variance. So I'll make one pitch that I think also the other advice I'd give is be multidisciplinary. Get someone else besides a psychologist to study the problem. Chris, Chris Banks is sitting in the back and I, talking about work, it's mainly Chris's work. I sort of sit there and say things at certain times. <laughs> is um, we've created the Interdisciplinary Center for Healthy Workplaces to study what's meant by healthy workplace from the perspective of a psychologist. And there are clinical psychologists, there's community psychologists, but also there are people in ergonomics, in public health, in public policy, uh, in architecture, getting all these people together, all of them to talk about the problem of what makes for a healthy workplace. You'll explain more variance if you have a different perspective than just our siloed approach. So I would say research from a multidisciplinary perspective. Ed. I think we got time for probably two more. Yeah. Related question to that is that uh, <clears throat> when you got into the field, when many of us got into the field, was not um, a kind of a planful developmental sequence. When I was in graduate school at Bowling Green, I took a course um, on vocational psychology. And I learned about all these things, and how everything was sort of planned. Uh, interesting side, how many of you know John Arnold is a well-known industrial psychologist now? I took the course from his father, who was not an industrial psychologist. But the, everything was planned, and it had to do with development, childhood, you know, social influence, etc. I believe in serendipity. Uh, it's true for me, you know, we went out to bowling, uh, to Berkeley, um, it was luck that I was, that Frank already had a job, uh, <laughs> and I had a job and so I got that, so there's a lot of serendipity that happens and you got to take advantage of it. So being too planful early on is not the great, greatest thing. I would say open your eyes up to other avenues, explore different kinds of things before you get set. Because once you get out of graduate school, for many of you, for most of us, you're going to be studying this minute problem for the rest of your life, <laughs> okay? And now everything is big data, you know, the big thing. Well, I say big data, small problems, okay? <laughs> um, study the problem, with, again, from a multidisciplinary disciplinary perspective. And one more, we got another one? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so were you, since you do program kind of under the IO program, were you ever worried for the, the state of the IO program? Yes, I, I think the question is, was I ever worried about uh, IO programs in the U.S.? I was, I am, I was and am. I think a lot of uh, what we know as IO psychology has gone into the business school. 
Um, and um, that's okay if you're learning psychology there. Uh, and it's diminishing in psychology programs. Uh, I think in part, even at Berkeley, I could have asked to be transferred to the, I don't know if they would have accepted me, I think they would have. And I would, my salary would have gone up, I think, by 15, 20% just being in the business school. But I enjoyed talking to other psychologists. So my next door neighbor was a community psychologist and a developmental psychologist. With all due respect to people in marketing, finance, and accounting, if I was in a business school, they would be my next door neighbors. And I prefer to talk psychology. So I would hope that we can stay in psychology departments, even though I recognize that the, the finances are such that business schools are attracting more and more of the IO psychologists. A number of my students have gone into business school. So it's, it's okay, but it's a problem, it's a potential problem. One more question. Yeah, I only saw one students. more. I was going to say, I only <laughs> saw one more hand, so we'll, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, what I've been doing the last couple years is when I retired, I also became the president of the Emeriti Association at Berkeley. And so I've been working on things with them. Uh, but again, it reflects my interest in IO psychology. Berkeley does a very good job in preparing you for retirement by having pre-retirement workshops. So if you're thinking of retiring, you can go to a series of workshops on um, health benefits, um, insurance, uh, wills and estates, what I call nuts and bolts. So I'm working on programs now, what I call psychosocial aspects, where we bring couples together to talk about what retirement is going to be like from a transition from a faculty member where you're important, people ask you questions, you go to a departmental meeting, you get respect, etc. Once you retire, you, you lose your office, nobody cares what you say, uh, and so <laughs> you gotta get used to that. So, my, uh, so I'm still working on that, I still do a little activity of advising yeah. on boards. Yeah. Well, his, his involvement in that society, by the way, boded well for me because uh, he's trying to do <laughs> interviews with faculty who are retiring. So he really couldn't say no because the karma <laughs> could come back to him in a not so great way. So I want to thank all of you guys for coming. I, I especially want to thank Shelly Zedek uh, for, for taking the time to do this and to share with us the perspective he's gained over the years. And um, I, I also want to say it really is like it's such a great experience to meet people who you've known their stuff. And, you know, we saw I saw you give a talk about the law school admissions stuff when I was a grad student at Bowling Green State. But it's really a great experience to meet somebody that you've kind of looked up to and and they're a really great person too. Thanks. And so so it's been a pleasure uh, getting to know you, Shelley. So no, thank no, you very thank much you and thank you guys. Come see us next year too. <laughs> thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you, Stephen.